Right. Oh, good afternoon, people. Thank you for joining us. So nice to see you uh, coming on now on this beautiful summer's day. Um, hopefully uh, you are able to uh, be enjoying this, hopefully from your garden or maybe indoors with a fan on or with air conditioning, I don't know. But thank you for taking the time to join us today. Great to see so many of you coming online. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure and a privilege as always to be hosting one of our members webinars. I think this is particularly exciting and timely today uh, with the real focus on high speed logistics that we've seen in the last few weeks. Um, so um, it's brilliant that we're able to take the time today to, to go into a bit more uh, of an in-depth discussion with colleagues from Evershot Rail about their SWIFT proposition and uh, the prototype unit that they've had on display in the last few weeks, which has been really exciting, I think, for everyone to see. And before we get into today's uh, presentation and discussion for proper, let me just do a couple of bits of housekeeping. Um, I think, colleagues, we will be OK to share your slides after the event. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. So if you want to get a copy of those slides, just ping Yvonne or myself an email in the usual way and we will get those over to you later. The uh, webinar is being recorded and we'll pop that up on our YouTube channel uh, later today or early tomorrow. So if you need to nip out for something or you want to come back to it later or indeed you want to share it with uh, friends and colleagues, then you'll be able to do that and it'll stay up on our YouTube channel. In fact, you can see uh, most of our webinar series uh, on that channel uh, by one or two. So do have a look at those if you've missed one and you want to come back to it. Uh, and uh, this is our last webinar before the summer break. And then when we get back in the autumn, um, we are working on plans for a couple more, uh, which will feed in with what we're hoping will be a resume, resumption of some real life events as well. Uh, but if you are interested uh, in our webinar programme, do keep an eye on our website or indeed if you're a member on our members list. And finally for me, if any of you online today are not members of RFG and you are interested in being a member, do look out uh, tomorrow. We are launching a half price membership uh, campaign over the summer. Uh, we're calling it the Summer of Rail Freight and I think it is a real opportunity. So if you want any more details on that, if you're not a member, then please do uh, look out for that or just give me or Yvonne a shout. Uh, but there we are, housekeeping done. Let us turn to the real business of today. And I'm really delighted uh, to welcome Sam Gillis and Nick Delacell from Evershot Rail, uh, who are going to talk to us today about uh, the work they've been doing in light logistics and their SWIFT project. Uh, by way of introduction, Sam is the account manager uh, at Evershot with responsibility for the freight sector, has been working really hard on this project uh, over the last few months, and uh, been uh, making some really good progress on the development of, of SWIFT. And Nick is a product development manager at Evershult, who's uh, been working hard on, I suppose, recycling, upcycling uh, older units and looking at what uh, potential they've got to do different and better things in the future. And, and Nick's also been working on this project. So without any further ado, uh, Sam, Nick, over to you to take us through the presentation. And thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Maggie. I'll just share my screen for everyone. Hopefully this will work. Can everyone see that? Not yet. Not at the moment. Okay, bear with me. There we go. That's it. There we go. Just need to make it full screen. Okay. That should be there, I think. Go on. Perfect. Excellent. So yeah, thanks for the introduction, Maggie. So um, as as Maggie gave the nice the good intro, we've we've been working on this for, for the last 18 months or so. Um, and we had initial inquiries probably in, in late 2019. Um, it's taken us a while to to want to understand the market and the potential for that. Um, we've had lots of uh, conversations with with the industry and interested parties as well as um, some independent consultants um, and um, yeah we certainly had to get buy-in from the Evershot business as well to make this um, an opportunity that that's worth pursuing but we've certainly made really good progress um, and we'll show you the progress in the next few slides so just um, as a way of 
um, showing you what we're presenting today. Um, I'll go through a very brief introduction to Evershot Rail for those of you who aren't aware of who we are and what we do. Um, we'll then look at the growth home delivery, uh, growth in van and HGV traffic, which um, which plays into the opportunity for express rail freight. Um, a wider look at the opportunity and the size of the market. Um, then a section on why rail um, and what express freight can bring to the logistics sector. And then we'll go into the specifics on the Swift express freight project as a whole. So capability, the product, the team that's worked on the first in class unit, which has been completed. And then there's a section on what next and then a summary just to finish off. So, yeah, kicking us off, just a quick intro into Evershot Rail. So, um, we're a rolling stock leasing company. We own a large portfolio of trains consisting around uh, 3,400 vehicles. Um, that's split mainly in the in favour of passenger. Um, and we have about 83 class 66 locomotives, which we lease to Freightliner and GBRF, respectively. Um, from a passenger side, we lease um, a wide variety of different trains to the likes of East Midlands Railway, Transpennine Express, LNER, Northern GTR, and quite a few others. Uh, we're one of the three big Roscoes, along with Angel Trains and Porterbrook, um, established at the time of rail privatisation in 1994. So we've been going over 25 years. Um, in 2015, we were taken over by CK Infrastructure Holdings Limited, uh, which is based in Hong Kong. That deal was worth um, in excess of two and a half billion. So in terms of the fleet portfolio, we own around 25% of the current uh, UK train stock. Um, as I say, it's quite a diversified portfolio. Uh, from quite elderly vehicles, um, you know, 75 mile an hour suburban commuter trains to lots of new build trains, which we've introduced over the last few years, such as um, Northern 331s, 195s, uh, GWR 802s. And we were the first uh, leasing company to introduce Hitachi into the UK market. So the, the Javelin fleet operating on high speed one. As I say, we've got 83 class 66 locomotives, which is around 18% uh, market share. Um, and then we we heavily invest in, in new trains, but also existing rolling stock. So in the last decade, we've invested over 3 billion in new trains um, and 1 billion invested in new rolling stock over the last five years or so. And as you see, they're successfully delivered in terms of Northern um, and the 802s, et cetera. Um, we're particularly strong in London commuter market. Um, we've also had a long, long term presence in Scotland. Um, and in many cases, we'll undertake heavy maintenance and upgrade activities on behalf of operators as well. As I say, we don't just invest in new builds, so we heavily invest in our existing fleet portfolio. So, on average, it's about um, £100 million per annum on our existing fleets. Um, in terms of how Evershot Rail is made up, we work reasonably small company, around 110, 120 people. Um, lots of professional engineers, as account management team, of which I'm part of, project managers and product development, which uh, my colleague Nick Delcel uh, works within as well. So as a business, we work very much in terms of the, uh, the asset, the, the whole life management of the assets, understanding and managing residual value risk, um, but also working obviously with the industry and, and the customer on, on what's needed to um, to enhance the customer experience as well. Um, we have, we've certainly got a key um, role and, and drive in terms of decarbonisation. So we're at the forefront of the industry in that sense. We're continuing to work on numerous projects. So some of you will have um, read and heard about the Class 600 Breeze Hydrogen train project with Alstom, which is continuing. Um, and you'll have seen the, the battery introduction, which is planned on the 802s uh, for Great Western. Um, so we announced in December that uh, we're working with Hitachi to introduce battery power, which will um, uh, we, we should result in fuel savings of around 20% um, and therefore uh, reduction in carbon emissions. Which kind of leads me on to 321 Express Freight. 
So that's kind of another example of our commitment to decarbonize the railway. So we're utilizing more elderly stock, um, which, which has been replaced by new build on Greater Anglia. And, um, and it shows our appetite to work with the industry and explore new markets and opportunities. So that's the introduction to Evershot. I'll move on to um, Express Freight Focus. So first off, just the, the growth in home delivery. So I think for all of us, we've, we've been ordering more online. Um, shopping habits are changing. Um, I, for one, see a, a delivery or home delivery van, I think every two hours, certainly on my roads. I think that's the same for most now. Um, we've seen the, de the decline of the high street, which has been ongoing for a number of years, but has been accelerated by, by COVID. Um, and there's been obviously an increase in, um, in people moving online or having the need to order online. Um, and that won't change, or, or certainly those habits have changed for, for good. So that's driving a exponential increase in, in home delivery. Um, you'll see there that the COVID pandemic has, has accelerated the trend. 17.2 um, million people say they've permanently changed their shopping habits. There's no sign that the reopening of the high street has changed this trend. So um, if anything, the home delivery and e-commerce market will continue to, to increase. Um, another contributing factor or background to this is the growth of van and HGV traffic. So you'll see on the left hand side there that vans and HGV traffic contributes a significant proportion of greenhouse gases. So as of 2018, they're 17% um, HGV, 16% vans. So you'll note there that van traffic has certainly increased in terms of um, greenhouse gases, that's despite improvements in technology and um and decarb in terms of in terms of van technology um, on the right hand side you'll see that um essentially more home deliveries leads to a growth in in traffic particularly van traffic van traffic van mileage has doubled in the last 20 years so whilst vehicles have become, become cleaner as i say emissions having uh, in, continued to increase so um and that's despite enhancements in, in vehicle technology. So in terms of the, the graph on the right-hand side, the blue line there indicates the um, increase in, in mileage, um, but regardless of the improvements in, um, in technology, there'll still be a considerable greenhouse gas um, emissions from vans, which again represents a, an opportunity for rail freight to, to remove vans and HGVs off the road, um, and essentially provide a solution for, for e-commerce and decarbonisation in that sense. Then just um, a bit more around the, the size of the market and the wider opportunities. So you'll see there that um, the time sensitive goods market is made up of um, mail and parcels, fresh food, plants and flowers, other food and drink. So it's a large large sector um, and these currently account for 125 million tons of freight moved by road per annum so there's a massive opportunity in market there which um, express rail freight can tap into um, a total of 3.8 billion parcels delivered um, during 2019-2020 um, and parcel volumes have increased further by over 25 percent during the pandemic and that's really an approximate number in terms of some logistics companies um, we've been quoted um, growth of being maybe 250 percent in one year from one parcel business so um, there's considerable volume there which continues to increase um, third bullet point there e-commerce as we said is growing massively the uk is the third largest market after china and the us and then you'll see that in terms of where the market is going and growth um, you could argue, have we reached a peak? But um, according to um, the charged retail uh, report that was recently published, the market's expected to increase by 40% over the next three years. So yeah, it will continue to increase. Um, and you'll see there's some examples there uh, from Royal Mail, Hermes and DPD around the, the volumes, um, certainly the increase in volumes that's been experienced over over the last 12 months or so. 
So there's a massive opportunity for, for rail to play a part in this. Then on to why rail. So um, as I say, parcel volumes and e-commerce continues to grow. Um, I think there's probably a case that without alternative transport modes such as rail, um, e-commerce can't grow at the rate it currently is. Um, it needs to look at alternative methods. Um, there, I think there's a huge difficulty in, in moving the volumes now, certainly with our expectations for next day or even same day delivery in, in terms of cities. Um, there's obviously the, the difficulties around Christmas peak. Um, there's historical issues that remain across the UK, which, which needs to be addressed. And I think that was, was apparent at last Christmas where parcel companies struggled to deliver on time. Um, a four car swift unit can take approximately four lorries off the road. So there's certainly capacity within trains to really take a substantial volume of parcels and goods, which can only be a good thing from a um, sustainability and environmental perspective. Which is, which is a really good point in terms of how we tackle the climate emergency. Um, parcel logistics companies have their own decarbonisation targets to achieve. Um, and I think there's a realisation now that rail can be part of that solution. Um, just a couple of companies um, amongst many that have committed. Um, Amazon, for example, has committed to net zero carbon across the business by 2040. Sainsbury's has pledged to be carbon neutral by 2040 as well. And um, Nestle has, has announced similar to be um, carbon neutral by 2050. So there's some serious commitments there where I think the realization is that um, it's got to be taken seriously and, and other options have to be looked at other than um, their traditional road methods. Um, you'll have all seen the transport decarbonization plan that came out last week, that graph um, is taken from that report. We all know that, that rail is, uh, is one of the lowest contributors to carbon emissions. Um, so rail really has to press home that message. Um, and again, I think there's some work to do in terms of, I suppose, translating that message to potential um, parcel companies and, and um, logistics companies um, that they know that, and that can obviously play a part in their own decarbonization strategies. Um, obviously, we're, we're all about encouraging modal shift here, so um, uh, working towards that net zero emission target by 2050. Um, I think it's clear to most on the call that we need to move more goods by, by rail freight. Um, I don't think we can achieve that net zero unless we do, um, and certainly with the uh, growth in e-commerce, there's an opportunity there. As I said earlier, there's a high capacity with rail. Um, we can take four HGV, um, HGVs off the road with one four car train. 321 Swift can travel up to 100 miles an hour. Um, I think an average speed of a Swift unit uh, from A to B will be around 70 miles an hour versus HGV average, which is probably lower than 30 miles an hour. So there's a significant time saving with rail. Um, another key point as well, um, efficient access to city centres, avoiding road congestion. Um, we're talking with a number of uh, prospective partners around deliveries into, into London. HGVs just can't get into the congested um, centre of cities at the moment, um, and rail can. Um, rail can also enable the last mile green delivery. So um, you'll have heard um, the likes of Rail Ops Group Ryan talking about that end-to-end -end solution delivering into city centres um, and then doing the last mile to consumers with trams, electric vans, bikes, or even boat, for example, DHL does a, does a boat service along the Thames. So there's lots of options there. Uh, rolling warehouses. So that idea is really around, and you'll see some images later on sorting parcels and doing admin work whilst uh, the train is in transit. Um, so you can certainly store lots of parcels on board, but also making the most of that transit time may well increase efficiencies and, and reduce overheads. Um, so we've had some interest there just to look at that option. Um, there's the growth in rail served um, infrastructure. Some of you might have joined a recent webinar on, um, on uh, rail accessed warehousing, which is key to this. Um, there's certainly growth there, but there's more to be done. 
Uh, we know of obviously Iport, um, Durft in Daventry, Mossend um, in, in Scotland, but there's others as well that would really benefit from having um, fully electrified rail access. But, um, but certainly there's a, a really good platform to be used for, for e-commerce and the growth of, of high-speed freight. Um, just to the last two bullet points, just the, it's quite a key one, I think, in terms of HGV driver shortages. Um, two weeks ago, there was um, an article in the national press around Tesco really struggling to deliver uh, perishable goods. Um, I think there's around 100,000 HGV driver shortages at the moment. Um, DHL are actively incentivizing um, applicants for HGV drivers with a, with a bonus for staying on longer, um, which, which shows you the appetite to get people on board. Uh, Tesco have, um, have said that the delay in delivering goods is, is creating an additional 48 tonnes of food waste each week. And that's just one supermarket. So rail could really play a part in that. There's, there's certainly challenges around um, how you transport perishable goods, but there's certainly an opportunity to, to look at that area as well. And then lastly, just um, cost pressures on road deliveries. So as you'll see on the right-hand side, congestion zones, that's certainly in London, but more city centres are implementing congestion zones and clean air zones, which is impacting the, um, the viability of um, HGV operation as well. So yeah, just bring on to the next slide. Over to you, Nick, if you are happy to provide an overview to this bit. Certainly. Thanks, Sam, and good afternoon to everyone on the webinar. Uh, so SWIFT is the name that's been given to our conversion of 321 EMUs from passenger to high-speed logistics operation. Uh, they're electric units, and they draw power from the AC overhead electrification system, capable of up to 100 miles per hour and over long distances. Where the AC overhead system doesn't exist, they can be hauled from a suitable, uh, by a suitable diesel locomotive, adding flexibility. Um, the units themselves consist of four cars and can be run in multiples, allowing for four, eight or 12 car operation. Um, and whilst the, the Swift demonstrator that we'll show you on some of the photographs later, it's, it's got a range of features to show you what is possible. But essentially, that interior can be adapted to the needs of customers, including retention of toilets, seating to accommodate staff. Uh, and as Sam mentioned earlier, uh, in terms of rolling warehousing, that, you know, sorting staff could be accommodated on the vehicle and, and have those facilities. Um, it's, uh, we've, we've also got some work that's recently been commissioned to further optimize the interior space. So we're looking to obviously maximize what is available. Uh, and the units can go on many routes in the UK and they're easy to maintain and operate. Uh, can go on to the next slide, please. So, each SWIFT unit has a payload of over 38 tonnes, which, which needs to be distributed evenly across the unit, of course. Floor area is approximately 170 72 square metres. Um, each vehicle has four powered sliding doors, uh, giving the ability for quick loading and unloading. Um, and as you'll see in the photo uh, below, um, a standard Titan rail retention system has been fitted at 1.4 metres above floor, uh, which enables many different retention systems to be utilised with that. Um, and the demonstrator itself utilises cup and bar approach uh, for the retention system. Next slide, thank you. Uh, so here we have uh, three images from the interior of the demonstrator uh, unit. Uh, again, you can see the Titan rails that have been uh, positioned 1.4 meters above floor, uh, and that's been coupled with the cup and bar system. Uh, on the top photo, um, you can think you can just about make out there's been two seats have been retained in, in the driver refuge area which, as I say, can be potentially used to accommodate travelling sorting staff during operation. And next slide. Uh, further three photos here from the demonstrator unit. A um, bit more focus on the flooring. You can see the stainless steel flooring that's being applied. That's gone over the existing flooring and also, as well as uh, rugged flooring, acts as uh, ballast in terms of the loading of the vehicle. Um, 
On the top right photo, you can see uh, some protective uh, bars that have been put in place to avoid trip hazards for existing on-floor um, systems. So in this particular case, it's the OTMR, the on-train monitoring recorder, and also the GSMR, the global system for mobile communications in railway. Um, and the next slide, please, Sam. Um, and just to talk through, this, this has involved uh, a number of organisations forming the collaborative team that have developed SWIFT. Um, it's been a partnership with Evershot Rail, Ricardo and Wabtech. Uh, fundamentally, Evershot Rail have defined the requirements and funded work on the first unit, the demonstrator unit. Uh, in addition, we've obviously brought a wealth of knowledge from our experience of these units operating for 27 years or so. Uh, Ricardo have been the principal contractor, taking responsibility for all the engineering, project management, uh, standards compliance and unit delivery. Uh, whilst Wabtech have delivered all the physical work on the demonstrator using their team and experienced staff. Uh, so, and, and obviously part of their work is included in uh, the strip out of the, uh, the units, its modification, installation, painting and testing through to a fully operational ready unit. Right, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. So then I suppose what's next for SWIFT? So as Nick was just saying, we, we have the, the first in class demonstrator unit completed. Um, that was completed a few weeks ago. Um, we use the word demonstrator, but this is an in-service unit already for service. So um, we have a, a lease due to be signed um, probably this week, if not next week, um, the unit will go to um, an operator. Um, we're, we're expecting to be able to announce um, the identity of that operator this week or next week. Um, it will then go on active uh, service trials um, during August. Um, all being well and uh, the customer is satisfied, we'll look to convert subsequent units. So we're in the process of uh, of assessing the, the timeline for that at the moment. Um, and the likelihood is we will have further units available um, later this later this autumn. Um, I think it's key that, and I think we're, I'm, I'm certainly really pleased that we've made this investment to, to convert this first unit. Um, it's quite a substantial investment um, for a first in class unit, um, as well as resource from, uh, from myself and colleagues. Um, but we really need to get the unit out there into trials and service to prove the concept um, without actually seeing a train um, in action it's very difficult for people to sign up um, but we've we've certainly got really good engagement for a number of different companies um, and there's really a, a drive to, to look at this and it enhance their operational services um, certainly picking up to the Christmas peak and beyond and as I said it kind of this kind of perfect storm of the climate emergency, huge volumes of e-commerce um, and, and the need to decarbonize, as I said, is all coming together with the availability of, I suppose, older rolling stock in terms of 321s to, um, to make this a viable opportunity and the right time to do it. Um, as it says there on the third bullet point, there is a, a challenge which, which is evident around the last mile capability. So, 321s are uh, electric train, um, but there will be access to uh, rail warehousing, which is which is off the wire. Um, and to make this a long-term viable concept and bring the cost down and competitive with road haulage, we need to offer a a last mile capability. So we're we're looking at battery-based self-powered version. Um, so we're currently assessing various proposals in that sense. Um, and we're hoping to have um, units available during 2023. So that's very much in our in our mind. But I think the key thing is to to use the Swift uh, Swift units as they are um, electric units, prove the concept, and then look to how we can um, optimize the last mile as well as capacity, as Nick alluded to earlier. Then just finally, in terms of summary, I, I won't go over too many of these points any further. Um, 
but I think in terms of, I think the, one of the key things is that last point in terms of it's a developing market um, in which we, we need to work with stakeholders to support support the needs of, uh, as they evolve. Um, as I said at the start of this, this presentation, Eversholt is, a, is essentially a rolling stock leasing company. We, we're not experts in logistics um, and what's needed there. So we, we've, we've invested and converted this first in class unit. Um, there's various configurations which, which we could look to do and maximize the space, uh, relocating the electrical equipment uh, there's toilets on board, as, as Nick said earlier, which we may look to remove. Um, but some customers, it, it may be a case that maximising space is key. Others, it might be the, the case of shuttling from A to B as many times as possible. So there's there's work to do, but we've certainly got got a unit done. Um, I think the opportunity is there, the volumes are there. Um, so yeah, it's an exciting project, which we which we hope to develop further over the next six months or so. So yeah, thanks everyone and hope that was useful and um, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you might have. Brilliant, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, I should have said in my uh, waffling introduction to those on the call, please do drop your questions into the Q&A box and we can already see some coming in. Uh, whilst uh, people have a moment to think. Um, Nick, what was the most challenging part of the conversion? That's not like an interview question, that, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, well, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of um, team working involved in here. So we had three organisations um, developing the product. Uh, so it's very, very challenging to obviously um, make sure that we have understood requirements uh, delivered through to uh, an operational uh, demonstrator unit. Um, the the actual the actual idea of obviously stripping out a unit is. is fairly simplistic, but obviously then utilizing that to the best efficiency and providing the best amount of loading product. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's been, been a very exciting uh, collaborative piece of work. And in terms of um, the unit that you're using 321, is that restricted on the network or has it got, obviously it's overhead electric routes only, but has it got go anywhere capability in effect? Yes, yeah, it's, 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 so, well, as, as exactly as you say, in terms of the overhead network, it's obviously um, primarily restricted to that. But, but as I mentioned, there is the potential for use of a, of a diesel locomotive to extend that range. Um, it is a, a reasonably go everywhere in terms of uh, existing route clearances, but, but clearly um, any, any additional routes beyond where it currently operates would need to be cleared as such. Yeah, just to add to that as well, we have done additional work to, to look at route clearances where the route requires it. So um, we've already invested quite a substantial amount in, in doing so, dependent on the opportunity. So um, we're open to looking at to routes that might not be cleared um, to, to support the customer requirement. Okay, brilliant. Okay, right, we've got some good questions coming in. Let, let's turn to those for a moment. So Alistair Leach has asked, do you have a view on the length of flows that the unit might be used on? Is it going to be London, Scotland, long haul, apprentice and trunk hauling, or short haul, such as Midlands, London, etc.? Yeah, good question. So it's interesting. There's quite a, there's quite a variety. So um, some of you will have seen that I think Rail Operations Group of Ryan are, are due to start services with their own project um, later this year from Midlands to Scotland. There's certainly an interest from multiple partial companies on that on that sort of route. Um, there's a um, high proportion of logistics companies in the Midlands, and there is certainly a, a bottleneck or a struggle to do next day volumes to Scotland with current uh, with current HGV methods. So there's certainly interest there for multiple parties. Um, but that said, and I think I, I mentioned this in the presentation, there is interest around doing reasonably short, um, even 20 mile, um, routes from outer London into central London. So if you're trying to deliver um, a large number of goods into central London for uh, in peak hours, certainly in the morning, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, and that's certainly what's been expressed by um, a number of different companies. So if rail can deliver directly into uh, central London stations, and then ideally the last mile with cargo bikes, electric vans, that is the 
that's the dream, so to speak. Um, there's lots of logistical operational challenges, but um, but that's certainly something that will be explored. Yeah, I think uh, you know, and I think you're absolutely right. We use high speed logistics as a bit of a catch-all for things which could actually be very disparate and different models, mm. and could actually bite on, you know, quite distinct parts of the supply chain. And you know, I, I think uh, you know, Amazon have just started e-cargo biking from a disused car park in the city, which they're yeah. HGVing into but, you know, as a test of, of that sort of hub and spoke model. Yeah, and yeah. that's parcels, but it could equally be roll cage milk or. Like yeah, that. and it, and it's um, I think for anyone who's 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 driven to work today or recently, car volumes have probably exceeded or, or certainly gone way beyond uh, pre-COVID levels. So um, yeah, congestion is certainly a problem which uh, which isn't going away. So um, there needs to be a solution, and, and rail can play a part in that. And there isn't a city in the country that isn't looking at how to make its streets more livable. And, you know, deliveries are always a thorn on the side of that yeah. debate. Um, a question from Mike Hatfield then. Competition is double-deck HGV trailers, which are highly efficient, or at least some parts of the competition, I'd say, perhaps. But given that most e-commerce parcels start life at a large customer fulfillment centre, how will the economic stack up if you can't load direct at those centres? Yeah, again, that's, that's definitely one of the challenges. Um, I agree that if you're double-handling double, double handling goods, um, you do have a challenge there. Um, that being said, we do know from feedback from a number of parcel companies that actually, if you asked them five years ago, would they have considered rail and it would have been more expensive, they would have said they wouldn't have touched it. But actually now the agenda around decarbonizing has, has become such a top priority, the cost is less of an issue. Um, of course, it will always play a part, but I think it's it, they're less, there's less pressure on that element. Um, so yeah, I think it certainly is a challenge. I think um, we do need, there does need to be investment in existing in infrastructure. And as we said earlier, the rail accessed warehousing, having parcel logistics companies on site at those facilities. So there isn't that double handling of goods is quite key. Um, but, but certainly some other feedback we've had is that the general public just doesn't want to see lorries up and down the road anymore. Um, so actually from a brand perception, sense removing those is quite a important thing for for a number of companies so um so there's certainly things that play in uh play in rail's favor yeah and, and and pressure to get rid of air freight as well i think is another another angle on it and of course the cost of air freight have been soaring in the last uh, two years with uh, reduction in passenger flights so i think that you know that there's lots of dynamics all coming together in this space a uh, couple of questions here, then technical ones. Have there been any identified platform train interface issues, for example, ramps for loading units, et cetera? Yep. Yeah, so um, we, we're thinking existing ramps could be utilized. Um, we are looking at options around, and I probably should have mentioned in the presentation that one of the key challenges and uh, you know, marks the success of this project will be the speed of unloading and loading of goods. Um, predominantly, it will be roll cages, um, but we are looking at perhaps palletization or ULDs, which are used in aviation. Um, but I think, as I said, we're not logistics experts. We will need to work with the operator who takes the unit this week and their customer. And that is the plan that we work with them on, on, on optimizing the overall process. So um, there will be various specialist ramps um, in the first instance, but you know, as time goes on and we grow the market, maybe we could utilize specialist equipment that's used on aviation, for example, in terms of you know, conveyor belt type systems. Um, so yeah, there's lots of options, but, but as I said, certainly challenges, but, um, but we seem to have the, the right engagement to make it, uh, to make it happen. Yeah, and as you say, you, you know, you're the asset owner and you, you put your investment into the prototyping and the yeah. relationship now with, with the, the lessor and their customers is key. Um, yeah. A couple more technical ones, if I can. Would you foresee the widespread use of passenger stations for loading or do you think it, this is a model that really works in and out of freight terminals or indeed both, I guess? No, I think, I think both. Um, we know that London Euston has uh, facilities there from, uh, I think, from... Red Star parcel days, I think. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but there's certainly facilities there that could be utilised. 
as I said, there will be challenges if you're unloading perhaps 700 roll cages from a 12 car set. How do you get them off within a reasonable time frame and then onto their last mile? So, but that that again will come with engagement with with end customers. Um, but yeah, it, it's both really. There, there has been really good engagement from Network Rail in terms of station access, and I think there's some ongoing reviews there, which is obviously key um, to bring to bring this into a wider market across England and uh, Scotland and Wales. So, so yeah, I think I think we're on a on a decent track with that. And linked to that, um, Anthony, charges for use of stations? Uh, question mark largely at night. Uh, have conversations taken place? You just broke up there, Maggie. Just could you repeat the question? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, city centre access will depend on network else charges for use of stations. Has any conversations taken place around that? So again, we we have had discussions with network rail, but not not in that sense. I mean, again, as the leasing company, we lease the the train to the operator. Charges in that respect will be between the operator and network rail. Um, as I said, there has been real good high level engagement from Network Rail, which and they're they're very supportive of, but I, I couldn't comment any further in terms of in terms of those costs. Okay, question from Julian Worth. What contact have we had with end users, such as the major retailers as opposed to freight operating companies? The end user view is vital in terms of establishing volume market potential as well as the critical detail of loading and securing systems. Yeah. Um, as I said at the start of the meeting, when, when we initially started discussions on this concept, it was very much an unknown. Um, there was certainly a wariness from Evershot, which is which is predominantly, as, as I've said, a passenger leasing company. Um, we needed to understand the market um, and, and could it be viable in, in, the, in the long term. So we have had lots of discussions with partial companies. I can't, can't say who those are. Um, we've spoken with consultants i'll mention nick gallup because he's been a great help from uh from our side some of you will know nick um and he's been working in this space for a number of years um, and knows the market very well so yeah we, we've had to build a picture um and it was key to get the um the feedback from parcel companies as to whether there actually was a demand here you know most of our conversations are with freight operators but you know, to get the customer viewpoint is key. So it's uh, it's somewhat new approach in terms of Evershot, but um, we are engaging directly with a number of parcel companies directly to support the operator and make sure that, you know, any enhancements or changes to the unit to maximise or, or utilise space is, is done for the right reason. Lovely, thank you. Okay, um, question from Sarah Pierpoint. Have you changed any of the access doors to suit larger items? No. Nope. So, um, again, the first in class unit is, is, for want of a better word, quite a basic conversion. So, we've tried to make it as generic as possible um, for whoever may use it. So, hence why we've left toilets in um, for sorting on board. Some or most may not need that. Um, doors will remain the same. Of course, if we were to structurally change um, the door size, that would um, impact the cost, um, and that which would then be passed on to the operator and then the end user. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility, um, but we think the existing door width and height will accommodate most roll cages and, um, and other types of load. Um, and I mean, one of the challenges is that there are many, many different types of roll cages. So um, depending on the appetite from the customer, um, there may well be a need for a bespoke roll cage, which utilizes the space. But we have indications that some are willing to look at bespoke roll cages for this platform. So again, that's encouraging as well. Yeah, you think a roll cage would be something where there was a universally agreed standard on it, but like all yeah. some logistics, there never is, is there? So, yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay, a question from Robert Pritchard. Thanks for the presentation. What sort of fleet numbers could we be looking at in terms of number of Swift units? And second part, was consideration given to fitting a diesel engine to give the last mile capability similar to what Orion have done? Yeah, so in terms of fleet size, um, I think we're planning to maybe have a fleet of perhaps 40 units, um, dependent on requirements. There's a, a juggling act around units coming off lease with 
Greater Anglia um, storage requirements and when these opportunities will come to fruition. Um, but certainly, as we indicated in the slide, there's a huge volume there. If, if Express Freight was just to acquire a, a reasonably large, uh, small proportion of that, um, certainly the 40 units would be, um, would be used up quite quickly. Um, I think it would be great to get 40 units. Um, proof will be in the trials, the loading and unloading times, and, um, and how it works in reality. But, but certainly, we're, we're thinking um, 40 units in the first instance. Brilliant. Yeah, it's, uh, as you say, it's all eyes on the trials and uh, and then the scale. Yeah. In terms of the customer interest, absolutely. But it is equally good to know that we're going into something that is scalable. You know, yeah. we haven't got the last two units available in the country or anything. So that yeah, that's and you know, we, we we have to also temper expectations. Um, you know, if this is a success, which we hope it all will be, there is going to be a time where we need to convert contract, etc. So, um, you know. We forget that some of these parcel logistics companies haven't experienced rail before. Um, you can't just put HGV drivers into rail vehicles and drive them, for example, uh, which was one suggestion. Um, so, um, they yeah. haven't got any HGV drivers if they wanted to. Yeah, okay. so, so, um, so, yeah, but uh, yeah, I lost my trailer floor, but yeah, that was my answer to that one. <laughs> okay, right. The last question that we've got on the question and answer then from Sam Walton. Is this a project that has pan-European potential? So again, we've had inquiries around could this be um, could this be used in Europe? I mean, three two ones aren't compatible. Um, the rolling stock that Evershot has within its portfolio is not compatible with European networks. Um, so that would be difficult. Um, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that we could look at new build. Um, and we have had some discussions around that, but of course it comes down to proof of concept. Um, as soon as you look to new build, there is a, a minimum order, substantial investment, and uh, yeah, you would need to prove the concept in some way before someone would uh, would look to take this on. Um, that being said, if we prove this in the UK market, uh, that should uh, generate interest and, and certainly your could be something that follows, but I think that's um, a long-term aspiration, I think. Yeah, I mean, I've, certainly from the conversations I'm having, you know, th there is a potential for pan-European. It's it's a different it's a different question, I think, to some extent, because there it really is about, I think, air freight and what happens. And of course, we've seen, you know, the French government acting to, you know, prohibit short haul air, and yeah. you know, if that, um, yeah, if that takes off as a as a policy theme across Europe, and of course they've just launched Fit for Fifty Five or whatever the the concept is around, you know, really mm -hmm. starting to get to grips with the cargo and commitments that they've made, that then starts to tilt that question on intra UK to Europe air yeah. freight in a very different light, of course. But you're right, it, yeah. it's not a three two one product, but conceptually. I think there's a lot yeah. of interest around that, uh, possibly yeah, I, even with HSM, yeah. who knows? Yeah, exactly. I think I think I I think that yeah, the UK market first. We'll see how this develops, and um, I think conversation will come in terms of pan-European, but uh, yeah, one step at a time. Brilliant. All right. Well, that uh, concludes all the questions that have been asked. Uh, so uh, last short last shout, I guess, if you've got a burning question that you haven't asked. Uh, Drop it in the Q and A box right now, um, because uh, I think you know that's been a really fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, really great to see the progress that you've made in a, you know actually a very short time in terms of getting the Swift prototype up and running, and uh, you know exciting uh, hints about further announcements coming up hopefully before the summer break for most of us, which which is really exciting and really good to hear. Uh, so you know, huge thank you uh, to Nick and Sam obviously for today, but also for all the work you've put in, in in the last year to get us to this point, which I think is, you know, genuinely, truly exciting. Um, so um, just a couple of reminders again, if you want a copy of the slides, uh, drop in Yvonne and myself an email and we'll get those over to you. And if you want to look back on the recording, we'll have it up online uh, on our YouTube channel, which you can get to if you know your way around YouTube, you just search Rail Freight Group and you'll find us. It's not difficult, uh, even for older people like myself. Um, so um, do look out for that as well. 
Uh, but Nick, Sam, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for those of you who joined us uh, and enjoy the rest of your day in the sunshine. Thank you very much, all. Thanks, thank Maggie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.